Mark 14, 22 is where we'll start. I'll give you a minute to get there. You may have noticed today on our table up here is a little different than usual. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper at the end of our sermon today. This verse is the establishment of the Lord's Supper, this passage that we're going to be reading together today. It's a short one. But we're going to talk today about what it means that Jesus brought the new covenant with his blood. We're going to be covering what it means to be in a covenant, what a covenant is, and then we are going to remember God's covenant with us together through the Lord's Supper. So we'll talk through all that, and hopefully that'll be clear, and then we'll do that together, and I think it'll be, I think it'll be good for us. So Mark 14, 22 is where we're at. Let me read this to us. As they were eating, taking bread, he gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, and said, take, this is my body. Taking a cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, shed for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray one more time. Father God, we thank you for the new covenant. We thank you for this word that you have given us so that we can know you, so that we can know your plans, and so that we can know your plans for us. Lord, I pray that you would help me today as I teach this word, as we learn and remember the gospel together. Lord, I ask that you would speak through me because this is your thing. And our, our meeting together is yours. And we are all here only because you have saved us and made us new. And so God, today I ask that you would pour out your spirit on us in a fresh way, that we might know you and see you clearly, that we might become more like Jesus and glorify you with all that we are. God, we love you and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk through this passage briefly together. If you remember, two weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus and his disciples preparing for the Passover meal. And this is what they then took together. They would do the Passover every year as Jewish people. And if you remember, the Passover was a celebration that God had saved his people Israel out of slavery. They, they were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years and God set them free from that. And he did that through the plagues. But the last plague was the death of every firstborn son. And God wanted to spare his people from that. And so he said, okay, look, if you put blood on the doorpost of your door, the blood of a lamb with a hyssop branch, then when this angel of death comes to, to punish Egypt and to remind Pharaoh who I am, then he will pass over your houses and your, your children will be safe. And so they did this, and he said, when you do this, remember me, the Lord your God, who is rescuing you now from Egypt. And he said, then you're going to do this every year forever. And this was the Passover celebration. They would kill a lamb, the Passover lamb. It had to be spotless. It had to have no blemishes. It had to be a perfect lamb. And they would kill that lamb, and they would eat it. And they would sacrifice it to God, and then they would eat it. And they would do this whole thing that, that came to be, and they called it the Seder. And, and modern day Jews still do this meal. It's called the Seder. And basically what they do is they go through and they remember all of the Egyptian captivity. And they remember all of the things that were terrible in Egypt and all the things that God had rescued them from. And what they would do is they would have these cups of wine. Now their wine was a little different than ours. Our, our modern day wine is just straight up. They would water it down a little bit because they would be sharing it with the kids as well. And so everybody would take a sip from the first cup. And that cup was to remember the torment of Egypt, to remember that slavery. And then they would do a second cup. And that was to remember the blood, or excuse me, that was to remember the slavery. The first was to remember the, the captivity and then the slavery. And then the third was to remember the blood of the lamb. And so it was probably on this third cup, the blood cup, that Jesus said, we're doing a new thing. We're doing a new thing. And so that's where we are. And so it says, as they were eating, he took bread, right? And they would have had lots of bread. And it would have been particularly unleavened bread. I forgot to mention that because they would have been doing the feast of unleavened bread. And they did that because when they left Egypt, they didn't even have time 
to let the bread rise. That was the idea. And so they had the bread and it wasn't risen yet. And they would prepare that every year as a remembrance that God had rescued them. So they had the unleavened bread. Jesus took it, broke it, and passed it out and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is my body. Now they were probably looking at him like, Jesus, what are you talking about? This is bread. This is bread. And then he took a cup and he gave thanks for it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he gives them the, the bread, says this is my body. He gives them the cup, probably like I said, that third cup and said, this is my blood of the covenant shed for many. Now, Mark is notorious for giving us very simple and short um, stories. Luke has tons more detail. Matthew adds a little more detail, but Mark's stories are very short and to the point. Luke adds a little more detail to this story in particular, or excuse me, Matthew does, and, and when Matthew records this story, he includes Jesus as saying, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. So he adds that in important, little, important little comment there. Now, the idea would have been pretty obvious, I think, to the disciples there. When they were drinking this, and Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, they were like, oh, something bigger is happening here. Because he probably did explain it like Matthew recorded as well. But here's why it's important that Matthew includes this shed for the forgiveness of sins. is because that is one of the only times in the Gospels that Jesus explicitly says, my blood is being shed for the forgiveness of sins. And in fact, that is the most important thing that Jesus did. That was his mission on the earth. He healed, yeah. He cast out demons, yeah. He did miracles. But that's not why he came. He came to die for sins. And that is ultimately what he did. And so when he established this, he established it as a remembrance of what was about to occur. And I think it's fascinating because God did the same thing with the Passover. The Passover was not established after the fact. No, God told them, here's what we're going to do. Paint the blood, do the thing, do the sacrifice, and then I'll pass over. And then next year and forever on, you're going to do this as a remembrance of what's about to happen. And so Jesus does the same thing and says, here we go, do this and remember it coming forward. Now again, in Mark, he doesn't say remember it, but in Luke, he does. In Luke, he says, as often as you do this, remember me. Remember me. And so that's what we're going to do here today, here in a little bit. We're going to remember him. Now before we move on, just briefly, I wanted to say, well, no, after, we'll, we'll talk about that after, what the, what the Lord's Supper is. First, I want to talk about what a covenant even is, because Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant shed for many. What is a covenant in the Bible? The truth is that a covenant, covenant is the most, one of the most important concepts that overarches the whole entire scripture. It starts in the very beginning, truthfully, with Adam. And, and we'll, we'll walk through that. So here's a covenant. A covenant is an irrevocable commitment made between two parties that involve mutual obligations, usually sealed with blood. That's what a covenant was. There, there were two kinds of covenants. You could have a covenant between equals. This is what we see with like Jonathan and David. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, it says that Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And they referenced this several more times that basically they made a covenant together. They said, hey, we are best friends for life. That was it. They made a covenant with one another. Marriage is a covenant between equals. Right? Micah, or excuse me, Malachi, in chapter 2, verse 14, says what Jesus, God is talking about, marriage. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and your wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Your wife by covenant. That's the part I want you to see there. Your wife by covenant. Marriage is a covenant between two equals. But that's not the kind of covenant that God has in mind between him and us, because obviously we are not equals with God. There was another kind of covenant called a 
a suzerain vassal covenant. Now, you don't need to know those words. Basically, it was a conquering king would come and make a covenant with the conquered people. The king was the suzerain and the people who had been conquered, they were the vassal. And what would happen is that king would come and he would say, here's how we're going to do things. I'll give you the ability to be alive and I'll protect you and I'll make sure that no other armies or nations are able to destroy you or come against you and I will help you in that. But you have to give me 20% of all of your food and grain and whatever and you have to give me, I don't know, your firstborn daughter. They, he was the king. He got to make the rules. It wasn't as though the conquered people would come to the king and say, hey king, how about you protect us and that would be great, thanks. No, it didn't work that way because you had been conquered. You didn't get to decide what the terms were going to be of this new king who was ruling over you. But the idea of making a covenant was a big deal because nobody could break that covenant once it had been established. It wasn't as though the king would come and say, all right, let's try this for a year. We'll see how it goes. If we don't like each other, we can just part ways. No, the conquering king would come and say, this is how it works now. You may not leave and I will not leave you either. Now, God's covenants are much more like the king than like the equals. Because God is the one who comes and makes these covenants. People don't come to God and say, hey God, let's make a deal. No, no, no. God comes and says, here's what the deal will be. You have no choice. This is how it's going to work. Now, that's good news because God is a good God. God is a good God. When God comes to make a covenant with you, it's never a bad deal. In fact, it's a better deal than you deserve. That, that's how God's covenants work. Let's look at Adam. Adam was the first covenant. Adam was the first man. And we don't see God saying, hey, I'm going to make a covenant with you. But we see a similar kind of, of situation happening with the rest of the covenants. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then he tells them, Every green plant is yours for food. And all the fruit-bearing trees, there's tons of them, by the way, in the garden. But you can't eat the one. And the day you eat of it, you will surely die. The one in the middle of the garden, the one of the knowledge of good and evil. See, that was the beginning of covenant between God and man. God made the man and then said, here are the terms of your existence. I will bless you and I will be with you and you will be my people and I will be your God. But go be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and don't eat from this one tree. That, those were the terms of that first covenant. We know they failed. And then Noah comes along. Genesis 6, we see Noah is the only righteous man, the Bible says, between, in, in all of the world, really. God said, I'm done with people because everybody is evil only continually. So, I'm going to wipe everybody out. But Noah, here's what it says, Genesis 6, 9. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. God makes a covenant not just with Noah, but with all of creation. And he goes on to say, the sign of this covenant is going to be that I will put a rainbow in the sky. And the effect of this is going to be that I will never flood the earth again. I'm making a promise to you. And then he gives them a few early laws. Basically, if any animal or any person kills a person, they're to die because man is made in God's image. So that's the, an addition sort of to the covenant. So it, the be fruitful and multiply is still in place. But now God adds with Noah, now you can't kill people either. I shouldn't have had to say that, but this is what I'm having to say now. Don't kill people because people are made in God's image. So the, the covenants are, are continuous. The covenant, excuse me, in the Old Testament is continuous. It's an additive kind of thing. And we're going to point this out as we go. It, it, it's adding on. God doesn't come and say, let's undo the thing with Adam. He says, let's add to the thing with Adam. Let's add to the thing with Noah. So now we come to Abraham. And Abraham is the next covenant that we see 
in Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham and he says, fear not, Abraham. I'm your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, just some governor. And he said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He won't be your heir. You will have a son. He brought him outside, and he said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. Now, this is cool because when we look up at the sky, we can literally number the stars because in Angel you can see about 15 stars. If you go further into the city, you can see about zero stars. But the further away you get from light and light pollution, the stars get really crazy. You start to see thousands and millions of stars. In fact, the sky before we had light bulbs was probably pretty breathtaking. And God told him, number the stars, and that's going to be how many offspring you have. See, this is the beginning of this covenant. Now, for the first time, God is going to call it a covenant. And what he does with Abraham, he says, all right, Abraham, or Abram at the time, go and get some animals. And he goes and gets some very specific animals, a, let's see, a bird, a heifer, excuse me, a female goat, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And then this gets weird. He says, cut them in half and lay them opposite of one another, right? I said at the beginning, a covenant is usually sealed with blood, and Noah sacrificed to God, and Abraham does this very specific ceremony that would have been common of making a covenant between a king and a conquered people, and he falls asleep, and it says that God passes between the pieces of the animals and roasts them as fire, and so God confirms this covenant with Abraham. And the covenant was, you'll have offspring, and I will make you a great nation. And that continues with Isaac, his son, whom God gives him, and Jacob, who then becomes Israel, who becomes the people of Israel. And then the people of Israel get captured into captivity in Egypt. And then God brings them out, and he brings them to Mount Sinai, which is in the wilderness of Israel. And he comes down on the mountain and he speaks directly to the people and gives them the Ten Commandments. And they told Moses, that was too scary. Please don't ever let God do that again. And so God says, okay. And Moses says, okay. And so Moses goes up on the mountain to meet with God. And there God writes with his own finger the Ten Commandments. And therefore he expands the covenant to include this new, these new commands, these new obligations for his people but he also increases the promises. He says, now not only are you going to be a great people, but you're going to be a great nation and you're going to have a land which I have set out for you, the promised land, which was Canaan. And he told Abraham that way back, but he really confirms it here with God's people on Mount Sinai. And that's when the law comes in, right? So again, all this is one big, long covenant. It's a big commitment between God and and his people. And God says, you do these things and I will bless you. Don't do these things and I won't curse you. And vice versa. If you don't do the good things, I'm not going to bless you. And if you do the bad things, I'm, I'm going to curse you. And so they fail repeatedly. And then David gets another part of the covenant, an increase of the covenant, because God was supposed to be the king over Israel. But they failed and they disregarded God, and then they asked for a king. And remember, God put Saul on the throne, and Saul was horrifying, and he was a terrible king. And so David comes after him, and he is this great king. And God says, look, David, you're going to be the symbol of all of what I want my kingdom to actually be. And he promises him through the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 7, he says, my steadfast love will not depart from Israel. Will not depart from Israel's king, excuse me, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. So God is increasing the covenant. And like I said, the covenant continues all the way. It's not new covenants. They don't change. They're just additions to the old covenant. But the problem is, human sinfulness meant that the covenant could never really be completed and fulfilled. 
God chose the people that he chose because he loved them, not because they were good. And they were never good, and they never did what God told them to do. God carried his end of the bargain. He made them a great nation. He multiplied them into the millions. He brought them into Canaan, gave them the promised land like he promised he would do, and they never obeyed God fully. And so there was a new covenant that was promised. As they're getting ready to go into Babylon, into captivity again, because of their many failings, God is holding up again his end of the covenant. I told you, if you don't do these things, and if you do these evil things, I'm going to curse you. Babylon is now coming to curse you. I'm holding up my end of the bargain. But Hosea promises a new covenant. Look, therefore I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. God, speaking of Israel. But there I will give her vineyards, and make the valley of Acre a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me Baal, for I will remove the names of all the false gods from your mouth, and they will be remembered by my name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow and the sword and all the weapons of war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfastness, love, and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And then Jeremiah promises something very similar. In in chapter 31, verse 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. See, this is the promise of a new covenant. God says, we're going to get rid of the old, although we can't just abolish it. The old is going to be somehow done away with and we're going to replace it with a new one. Something better is going to be coming. And Isaiah promises something very similar in chapter 52, that there's going to be a man of righteousness who's going to come and by his stripes, he's going to heal the land. So then comes Jesus. This is why our Bibles are split, Old Testament, New Testament. Testament literally means covenant. The Old Covenant was the Old Testament. Now the New Testament is the New Covenant. And Jesus fulfills the Old Covenant and brings in the New. Here's how Jesus fulfills that Old Covenant. He perfectly fulfills all of the law. Right? All of the things that God said, you do this and I'll bless you. Jesus as, a, as a, uh, a stand-in for all of humanity, lives that perfect life, fulfills all of that perfect law. He perfectly stewards creation. He interacts with the world in a perfect way. He heals and he brings renewal and all of these things. And then the most important thing is he perfectly sacrifices himself. Christ becomes the Passover lamb. He becomes the sacrifice for sins. And all of this sacrificing that they did in the old covenant where they would come and bring and there would be blood and there would be the temporary covering of sins by the blood of some animal. Jesus says, no, I'm going to cover you now with my blood and it's going to be perfect. Hebrews 7 to 10, if you're interested, all four of those chapters really cut into this and, and help us to understand what is going on when Jesus brings in a new covenant. And the biggest things, three things, really quickly. He becomes the high priest, he becomes the king, and he becomes the prophet. He was all three of those things. All three of these these offices that were in the, the nation of Israel, Jesus fulfills all of them perfectly. And more than that, he fulfills the old covenant so that the law can be done away with. Again, not that the law is thrown away, but so that we no longer have to live under that old covenant because Jesus became 
the, our stand-in and, and filled that covenant in our place. He fulfilled that covenant in our place. So now all the laws that were in the Old Testament, they're done. They're done for us. And now we, we live, as Paul says in Romans, by the new way of the Spirit, not of the old way of the law. Because Christ has made an end to the law for those who believe. He became a curse for us. So when Jesus says that this is the new covenant now in his blood, what he's saying is, look guys, in two days, I'll be dead. Tomorrow they're going to kill me. They're going to lay me in a grave. I am going to become the sacrifice. When Abraham cut those animals in pieces to make that old covenant, I am going to be a new and better sacrifice, a full and complete sacrifice. What animals could not do, I'm going to do instead. That's the new covenant. Ultimately, the new covenant is the gospel, that in our sinfulness, we could not obey God. We could never fulfill our end of the bargain. So God sent his son to die for us. That's what it's about. God sent his son to die for us so that now, even though we are sinful, through Christ, we are made clean. E even though we can never fulfill God's law, Jesus fulfilled it for us on our behalf and now paid for our sins with his blood. And now, rather than by obedience to a law, we enter God's new covenant by faith in the sacrifice that was made for sins. We trust in Jesus that when he died, he died for us to cover over all of our failures. And by that, we enter into God's new covenant. I know that's a lot. I know it's heavy. But th this, is, this is the main thing. I'll, let me reiterate this one more time. Christ died for us. We are righteous because of him. That is the new covenant. Our obligation is faith. God's obligation is everything else. And we don't get it. We don't get the covenant by works. We didn't make the rules with God. We don't come to God and say, God, okay, look, I'll be good enough and then you save me. God has said, no, that's not how it works. By faith, you're saved. By grace, by my undeserved favor on you, you're saved. Okay. That's what's going on with covenant. That, that's what it means that Jesus made a new covenant in his blood. So, let me remind us what the gospel is. I'm going to step down here, and then we're going to take this together. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what gets us in. Not this stuff. This is bread, and it's juice. It's not anything special. But the gospel is that God paid the price for our sins. We were sinners. God was holy. And we can't be right with a holy God. We go and stand before him, and he says, no, you're guilty, because he's perfect, and he's righteous. We're guilty before him. But Jesus died perfect life. He was God. He died so that now when we stand before God, we can say, Jesus already paid the price for me. That's what it is. That's the gospel. So it's, it's not that we believe that he exists. That's not helpful. It's not that we believe the Bible is true. That's not helpful. It's that when we stand before God, we know Jesus died for me. He is my Savior. That's how we enter in to the new covenant. And this that we're about to take is a reminder to us of what God has done for us. Right? This is juice and it's bread, but this represents his body. And this juice represents his blood, broken for us in our place to save us from our sins. So, as we get ready to take this, I we'll want us to do two things. Katie's going to come and play. And we're just going to take a few minutes and get right before God. That's what we're going to do. So if you know that there is sin in your heart, if you know that there's sin in your life that you need to confess to God, that you need to repent of and turn away from, I want to take this, this time to do this. Because Paul says that if we take this Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we are guilty of the body and blood of Christ. And that is something none of us want to be guilty of. So I want us to just take a minute I want us to pray right where we're at. Pray silently if you want. Pray aloud if you want. And we're just going to confess sin to God. And we're going to thank him for what he has done for us. So let's do that together.
God, we are sinful people. We're broken. And we are not good enough to be loved by you. But you loved us anyway. And you loved us by sending your son to die for us on the cross. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So that all of our sins could be washed away and we could be clean before you. Lord, we thank you that the price was paid for us. That all of the failures and the sins and the, the brokenness that we carry in our hearts and in our lives does not separate us from you anymore if we are in Christ. Lord, not that we hold on to those sins. We, we, we now we turn and we want to repent of those sins. We want to leave them behind us. We want to stop living in darkness and begin to live in life, live in light. God, th those of us whom you've called out of the darkness who now live in the light, we thank you for saving us from ourselves. We thank you for saving us from you and your wrath that was rightfully poured out on us. Lord, we thank you that Jesus stood in our place and that because of him, we are righteous. Lord, I ask your blessing now on this, on this juice and on this bread that as we take it, we would be reminded of the cross of Jesus Christ. That we would be reminded that a holy and righteous one took our place so that we don't have to take that cross on our own. So that we don't have to be punished and stand guilty for our sins. Lord, remind us as we take these elements of the sacrifice that was made for us by Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Amen.